Thank you, Brother Brad, for that update. And by God's sovereign plan, today we're going to be talking about being content, being content ultimately in Christ. Just an observation that I've had um, anecdotally, but nevertheless, uh, that is true, is that as I've traveled around the world, many times it seems that uh, the people that perhaps have less, much less than we do, seem to live a more satisfied and full life. So, like I said, what uh, a privilege to be coming to this passage today, which will give us more insight into contentment. So we are in the book of Philippians. We are in Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. We are almost done with the book of Philippians, so uh, here in about two more weeks, uh, we will announce uh, the next book that we're going to be studying. So please keep that in prayer. Uh, myself and the deacons have actually not decided on a book yet, but I mean, the time is here now, so we, we really need to decide. If you are able, please open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, or you could also look at it on the screen and stand for the reading of God's word. The inerrant and infallible word of God reads, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I may be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. For your word is truth. For your word guides us. It's like a lamp unto our feet that we can uh, use it as light into our lives into our everyday living, into our minds, into our hearts, so that we may be realigned to your will and that we may learn who you are more and more. Speak to us today, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so the theme of chapter 4 of Philippians. Remember, we need to exercise some discipline as we're reading through the scriptures so that we have an idea of what a book is generally about chapter is generally about in certain sections of scripture. Chapter 4 of Philippians, by and large, has the theme of Paul telling the Philippians as he is saying his goodbyes to them to stand firm, hold the line, don't fold, don't be discouraged, right? Tying that notion of encouraging the Philippians throughout his letter. This passage that we just read today is one of the ways that it has application in not becoming discouraged when the practical day-to-day -day resources are not abundant, right? So this is a very practical application. How does Paul deal with him being in jail and having little resources? What is his attitude? So therefore, I, I named this, uh, the title of this message, Dependence, Provision, and Contentment in Christ. Dependence, Provision, and Contentment in Christ. So let us set up this, this morning's study by me giving a sort of a background on how this is so important to us, the issue of contentment. What is the constant pursuit of mankind, generally speaking? Well... After our basic needs are met, generally speaking, man, humanity, we want to feel accomplished. We want to pursue happiness, right? The pursuit of happiness. We want to eliminate as many problems in our lives as possible so that we can be self-fulfilled. And that, in our minds, will lead to happiness, prosperity, and generally speaking, a good life. Now, there's nothing wrong in itself with us 
being disciplined and working towards goals. But the question is, what are we ultimately chasing after? What is it that in our minds we think is going to fulfill us, is going to give us contentment? Well, in our modern world, in our culture, where do people generally get their dependence? Where are they dependent upon? Where do they look to for their provision? And how is contentment defined or objectify? What are people really seeking to be content ultimately? On the one hand, in our human nature and in our pride, we want to be self-dependent. I'm good. I can lift myself up. I don't need anyone. I don't need anything. I can do everything. And because I'm so special and smart and strong, if only I could attain a certain amount of money or a certain amount of things or a certain amount of prestige, then I would be fulfilled. Right? Just reach a certain level of success, perhaps in my relationships or in other aspects of life. If I could just do that, I think I can do it. I'll be fulfilled once I reach that. On the other hand, there are some that will want to depend on another person or on a group, on a system, on a cause. And the thought there is, if I could just get behind this movement, if I could just get behind an agenda, whether political or otherwise, and we get enough people to really change the way they think, then we could all be fulfilled. Then we could all reach contentment. If we could just have enough good programs enacted, that would That'll do it. We'll be fulfilled. Right? So this is a constant pursuit of, human, of humankind. How can I deal with the fact that I'm not fulfilled and I want, to re, I want to reach contentment? How can I go about that? Now, as Christians, if God could give us something that fulfills us, what would that be? This is an important question because if we have a biblical worldview, if our mind and our hearts and our lives are influenced to be lived according to what God says, and we are indeed Christians, we have already obtained what it takes to be fulfilled. See that? that would be Christ, his forgiveness, his love, his righteousness, his faithfulness. But many times we take that for granted and therefore we are right along with the world trying to follow something that we think will fulfill us, but in fact will not. So we could be distracted. So the question for us today then is, <clears throat> what or who do I depend on for my provision and ultimately for my contentment? Am I content today or do I think I still need several steps to go in order for me to be content? Inevitably, in a maritalistic world, that we live, as Christians, we can be easily influenced by the world or by a false gospel for that matter, along with our selfish human nature to begin to chase after things that we think will make us content. But the reality is that those pursuits will only hinder our relationship and our worship to God. And now we find ourselves in idolatry, right? Putting other things before God, thinking that if we just attain some of those things, we're going to be content. Now, a common excuse from well-intended Christians is that we can build a goal. I'm going to, you know, build my certain empire or accomplish a certain number of goals or just get a certain amount of money. And, hey, I'm doing this for Jesus, right? So let us not fall into that trap. Let me just accumulate enough stuff, enough accomplishments, enough privilege, enough money, whatever it is, and then I will have contentment. But I'm doing it for Jesus. Be careful. I like to show an illustration that as I was studying this week for this message, it was like God sent that illustrates very well what this pursuit may look like. Take a quick look at that. Rest in peace. Play it again. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'll put my little commentary here. See, he's chasing after something. He's relatively well taken care of. And as he see expense all his life trying to pursue something that he'll never reach, and all of a sudden, your time's up. You're gone. See that? You could go back. So this illustration I thought was very powerful because if we are honest with ourselves, all of us are either in that type of pursuit or we will be or we have been. The question is, are we aware of that? Right? Are we aware that we might be chasing or we are chasing something that we think is going to bring us contentment, but in fact, it will not. In the U.S., there has been many in-depth studies regarding the happiness or fulfillment of people. And throughout recent decades, there's been more and more data to get a glimpse, an idea of are people content, specifically here in the U.S., let alone the world, but just in the U.S. To a large extent, we cannot ignore the fact that as people have met their needs of shelter, food, safety, and even some luxuries, right, compared to other countries, that forms the strong foundation to have a society that feels happy, feels content, right? To a large extent, that's true. However, ironically, what these studies throughout the decades have found is that as economic prosperity has increased, it appears that the measure of happiness of the U.S. population has decreased. See? There's a certain point when our basic needs are met. You know, we're not really worrying about what I'm going to eat today. We are kind of have that taken care of. But then due to the stimulus of us thinking we need so much other stuff, all of a sudden, our happiness, our contentment starts going down and down and down and down. It doesn't matter if we have more prosperity. This is well documented in an article by the Washington Post published in 2018, which cites various sources, various studies, and I'll summarize to you in four points. First point, according to a chief economist at the Decision Economics Company, Alan Sinai, he says that as of July 2018, the U.S. saw the largest and longest economic expansion in U.S. history. Sure, there's details that could be debated, but by and large, the data shows that great prosperity. Yet, according to the general Soci social survey given by a highly regarded public opinion research company, it showed that yet Americans reported a sense of being more unhappy throughout the decades and the peak of that economic success. Point number three, Americans on average rated themselves, quote, just a hair above pretty happy. Like, eh, I'm okay, but I'm not really that happy. Which is a significant decline from the nation's peak happiness, which occurred right around the mid-1990s, incidentally, after coming out of a recession. So some factors now that influence people being less content, this is interesting because to some extent it affects all of us. Get this, some factors that affected people not being content were the effects of social media. Why? Because social media gives us a false sense of being in communion, being in companionship. But people are actually isolated. They're really not social. A second thing that contributed to this was the opioid crisis, heroin, and other extremely addicted painkillers. Right? Something's wrong. People are feeling depressed, lonely. They have a false sense of companionship, so they turn to drugs and painkillers. And thirdly, which kind of goes hand in hand with all this, a poor lifestyle choice of bad health, junk food, no exercise, not taking care of our bodies, right? And there we are. So would we would think that economic prosperity would lead to thanksgiving and fulfillment, right, in, in general. But 
as this studies have indicated, that's not the case. The human heart is never satisfied with what the world has to offer, which that is a biblical concept. So there's nothing new under the sun. Scripture already tells us that. Now, the last point I'll make on this as we set up the, the sermon for today is that this data is from 2018. Note, 2019 and 2020 are not part of that. Can you imagine what the survey results are going to say when the 2020 data is published? I don't think it's going to be any better, right? Matter of fact, it's going to be significantly worse. So then, what does that tell us? Well, Scripture has a lot to say about human contentment and the provision that would lead us to ultimate contentment. This is not just for those of us that are Christians, but it's a call for everyone to realize where we can find ultimate contentment. It will not come by any amount of wealth accumulated, or on the other side, by living as simply as possible, and that way I'll be satisfied and eliminate my wants. That doesn't work either. Rather, we will see that the ultimate fulfillment we look for on this side of heaven will come only from knowing Christ, knowing that we are sinners saved from the righteous wrath of God by faith in Christ. And that in this lifetime, growing in that knowledge, growing in the knowledge of God, growing in our relationship with Christ, growing in obedience to God will bring us contentment regardless of the situation we find ourselves in. So for this sermon, we're going to reflect on three main points, which I've included there on the notes. We're going to be reminded how God is the means of ultimate human contentment. We're going to see that in three points. The first one, we're going to see the source of our provision. Where does our provision come from? Secondly, we're going to see the source of our needs. Why do we have needs? And thirdly, we're going to see the source of our contentment. Where are we to look for, for our contentment? So let's dig right in. Point number one, the source of our provision. We'll read Philippians 4.10. It says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So Paul has been instructing the Philippians throughout this letter to have joy, to rejoice. To be exact, Paul tells the Philippians this command 16 times in the book of Philippians. To have joy, to rejoice in the things that the Lord is doing for them and by them. Also, Paul has told the Philippians that they should be imitators of him as he is imitator of Jesus. In this very verse, Paul is already putting into practice what he's preaching. Because Paul is saying that he rejoices in the Lord. See, Paul applies what he preaches immediately. He's rejoicing that the Philippians specifically have shown a concern for his well-being. Now, make no mistake, Paul here is talking about being provided for. Right? He's not being like ultra-spiritual. He's talking about physical provision for him because he was in jail. Let us be reminded that Paul experienced being in jail several occasions. At one point, he was chained in a common holding cell in Philippi. That's recorded in Acts 16. He was also, possibly under slightly better conditions, jailed in Caesarea. That is reported in Acts 23. And then we know that he was jailed in a house arrest while in Rome, and that's recorded in Acts 28. Right? So Paul, being a preacher of the Word of God, boldly preaching the gospel, finding himself in this type of jail, we need to be reminded that Paul was responsible for his own nourishment and clothing and provision. The jails that we have nowadays, as bad as people may think they are, would probably be a luxury for Paul compared to the jail that he experienced. We can see this here, that when Paul was sentenced to jail due to a false accusation from the Jews, it says this in Acts 28, verse 30. He, meaning Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, 
proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. See that? So, Paul, why did you go to jail? Well, because I'm preaching the gospel and like the Jewish people don't like it. So what are you going to, what are you going to do when you're in jail? I'm going to preach the gospel. To whoever comes, whoever's there, the guards, the other prisoners, whoever visits me, I'm going to preach the gospel. See that? Unhindered. Strengthened by God preaching the gospel. So the key here then is that Paul rejoiced in the Lord, as the verse says, because he knew that God's providence and provision was going to be there for him. And in this instance, God is using the Philippians to send him provision. You see that? So God acted through the believers at that time to provide for Paul. So who is the source of provision then? God is. Who does God use for his provision? What are his means? The church. Let us not forget that. So then a question for us is, has God ever called you to meet the need of a fellow believer? Now, there's an interesting paradox there. Because when God's going to provide for someone, God promises that he'll provide for his people. No question. When he convicts a believer to do that provision to sacrificially provide for someone else, the paradox is that God actually doesn't need you. God is going to accomplish it because he's an infinitely powerful and sovereign God. However, if we disobey because of our pride and our selfishness, we will be in disobedience and we will be missing out on the blessing of God using us. You see that? God don't need you. But if you know there's a need and you don't step up, and God has convicted you to provide for that need, you will suffer consequences. Which is not that God is going to smash you or kill you, nothing like that, but nevertheless, it'll hinder an opportunity for you to have that tight fellowship with your brothers that you're helping and with God, knowing that He used you. Our selfishness gets in the way, right? If we're honest. And then we are not loving our neighbors as ourselves. So then the key there is that God is the provider. He will provide. He will accomplish it with or without your generosity. There's a chance for us to be used by God's provision and sovereignty, or there's a chance to miss out on that blessing. And God will speak, uh, um, Paul will speak to that in the following passage, which we'll look at next week. In which Paul says that he's more excited about the blessing that the Philippians are going to receive because of their generosity than he is about receiving the gift. Right? And just to remind us of that point, of us being the means that God uses to provide, let us look at Galatians 6.10. It says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Provision from God. He uses his people to accomplish it. And we should be in touch, in communion with God through his Holy Spirit so that when opportunities come up, we act upon it. Okay? I often like to remind ourselves, and our, especially our, our, uh, our brothers that we have candid conversations with, is that I learned something very valuable one time from a pastor where there was a need in the church and someone said, um, well, yeah, you know, there's this financial need and uh, we should pray for it. And the pastor said, mm, no, we're going to pick up an offering for this need and uh, whatever's left, uh, we'll trust that God will provide. So they did just that. And by the end of the offering pickup, there was more than what was needed. And then they did a prayer of thanksgiving. See that? So let us be convicted by that, brothers and sisters, and know that God calls us to be used. Leads to the second point, the source of our needs. As human beings, we need things, right? Philippians 4.11 says, Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation 
I am to be content. What does that mean? Paul says that he, not that he is in need. The Greek word there, need, hysteresis, it means the state of needing something that is absent or unavailable. Something that is just not there that you need. Paul is saying, that's not the case. Paul is not saying, woe is me, I'm suffering, I'm in such great need. Paul is not saying that. As a matter, as a matter of fact, he's saying, God has provided. Right? I'm, I'm not, God has not been unfaithful to me. God has provided. God has taken care of his needs in the past, and at this point now, he's going to use the Philippians to take care of his needs. That's what Paul is saying. With that said, what is the source of our human needs, just generally speaking? To that, there's a famous model that demonstrates this. It's a model purely from a sociological point of view, but nevertheless, it's worth being familiar with. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He divided into three basic types of needs. First is basic needs. That's you need food, nourishment, uh, shelter, and, and you need safety, right? You can be scared running for your life 24-7. That really would hinder you. So that's basic needs. Then the second tier of needs would be psychological needs. That's where our interpersonal relationships comes in, as well as our sense of esteem. Like we need to be uh, sure that we have some sense of belonging, sense of um, purpose. Like what, what am I going to do? I need something to do to feel um, esteem. And then at the very top, once those other needs are met or someone met would be self-fulfillment needs. That's where like ultimate contentment comes in. And that would be in his own words of, um, of Maslow says, achieving one's full potential, then you'll be content, right? Now, two quick comments about that. One is that it is undeniable that the hum that us as human beings, we have physical and non-physical needs. That's, that's a fact. While food, shelter, safety are essential for living, the second thing we should remember is that ultimate contentment will be impossible unless we realize that our ultimate need is spiritual, not physical. How do we know that? Well, we go to scripture. That's where we get our source of wisdom. Ecclesiastes 3.11 reads as follows. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So the source of our human needs, then, is the fact that we are extremely dependent creatures because we have physical needs, right? And the Creator has placed eternity in each of our hearts. So if we don't realize that our ultimate means of being fulfilled is spiritual, we're going to be chasing thing after thing, cause after cause, movement after movement, miracle after miracle, and we're never going to be satisfied. Because our ultimate fulfillment would come from knowing that our need is spiritual. Now, Paul says that he has learned to be content. Learned. What does that imply? Well, that is not something that came naturally. That the first time he got beat up and humiliated and left us dead, he was like, oh, okay, well, I'm cool with that. No, he said, I learned to be content. How does one learn to be content? It's really easy to be content when I'm relaxing in my AC house with plenty of food in the fridge. That's easy to get used to that. So then Paul says that he has learned to be content because he has been exposed to both extremes. In feast and in famine, in joy and in suffering, Paul has learned to be content. Content. 
So, brothers and sisters, generally speaking, let us realize that by and large, we are not living in need. By whatever standards we want to compare ourselves to, we actually, I dare to say, we probably live in luxury. So Paul is telling us he can live with much or little and still be content. There's many scholars who propose that Paul, prior to his conversion, as a respected Pharisee, lived a very well-off life. A couple of things point to that or are hints to that. One is that Paul was born a citizen. He had dual citizenship. He was a Jew and he was also a Roman. That means that either Paul's dad or grandfather bought that citizenship. According to history, that citizenship for Rome had many benefits, but it costed about 18 months of labor. So a common folk couldn't do that, couldn't afford it. I mean, even now, who has that available to you? Yeah, I'll buy that here. It's not possible. So that points that Paul perhaps came from a very wealthy family. Secondly, Paul's education is another significant indicator of his social status, which meant that Paul had to come from a wealthy family who could afford to send their son to a prestige institute to become, as he said, the Pharisee of Pharisees. Right, Very, very well-studied scholar. So in any case, Paul knows how to live with much in luxury, and he knows how to live with the bare essentials, the bottom of the barrel in an abandoned cell. See that? And he says that he has learned to be content. Why? Well, he, has, he says that he has learned to be content in any situation and learned the secret. See, that's very important. He says he's learned the secret to live in any and every circumstance. Paul says, I, I've learned the secret of contentment. And the million dollar question, what is it, Paul? Tell us. I'm glad we asked. That's the third point. Where does contentment come from? The source of our contentment. Paul says then in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strength, strengthens me. So hopefully by God's grace this morning, we can now have the right framework to know in what context Paul wrote that verse. You see this verse thrown around left and right. Inspirational quotes, believing yourself. Yeah, that God will help you. You know, you can do all things through Christ. What is the correct application, immediate application that Paul is giving us? Well, Paul wrote this verse in the context of being content regardless of his physical conditions that God would take care of all his needs. Not only that, but he rejoices because his most important need, the need for a savior, has been met. And therefore, he builds on that and says, whatever else happens, I know God's going to take care of me. And whenever it's time for me to go, which, as we will learn, Paul is sensing that his time is coming. He says, I'm okay. What do you say in the book of Philippians? To die is gain. And all the accomplishments that he had gathered from before and high honors and prestige from the religious Jews, he said, I count all that as garbage, dung. That's what he said. So Paul is saying, I'm good. I'm content. Feast or famine, I'm good. That's the secret of his contentment, that he depends on Christ to give him the strength, to give him the grace to be content. So let us not abuse this verse by setting all kinds of selfish goals then. Grab this verse and basically apply it by saying, well, I can do whatever I want to do because Jesus will grant my wishes. Wrong. The source of human contentment then is knowing that you are in Christ. And that because God will never leave nor forsake his people, we can be assured of God's provision. First spiritually, and then physically. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God 
and all those other things, your needs, right? Your worries about where you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to do. Then all these things are going to be taken care of. The spiritual fulfillment comes first. So let's, uh, let's land the plane here. What are we saying? How can we attain contentment then in our lives? I'll give a couple of biblical principles that we've been learning in the book of Philippians. First, humility. Humility. Being humble literally means to know our place. And when we talk about humility before God, in a nutshell is this. Realize that you deserve nothing. You deserve God's wrath. Because we are sinners by nature and choice. Doesn't matter how old you are. Baby, toddler, child, all the way to an older person. Doesn't matter. We deserve nothing. God owes us nothing. And yet he's merciful. If you are here today, he has been merciful to you. Let us be reminded of what Psalm 8, 3 and 4 says. It says, the psalmist is speaking. He says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? See that? God is powerful. God is self Sufficient, self-existing. He said it doesn't need us. And the psalmist is saying, how mighty and powerful you are, Lord. Like, who am I that you even care about me? That is the kind of God that we serve. But we cannot realize that until we realize that we deserve nothing. As a matter of fact, if we are here today, we've already received too much. We're breathing. We are Relatively healthy, okay, right? Secondly, thanksgiving, an attitude of thanksgiving. I always tell my daughter, una actitud de gratitud, attitude of thanksgiving. God has already given us his common grace to everyone, the whole world. And if we are in Christ, he has specifically given us his grace and mercy and for that we should be thankful thanksgiving right humility i deserve nothing secondly i've been given so much that should spark thanksgiving which by the way there's many other studies that show that one of the key elements of someone who is actually fulfilled and content is that they have an attitude of thanksgiving Thankful for what we have, for God's provision. And then lastly, the third point that is a biblical principle for contentment would be that true contentment is spiritual in nature. The reason why Paul was not in distress over his situation is that he knew that God is a faithful provider. The reason for the certainty that God is a faithful provider was that Paul's contentment consisted of first spiritually content and then materially content in whatever circumstance. He was okay with whatever came. So Paul's rejoicing and contentment in Christ did not come because of his physical conditions. Paul's physical conditions were horrible. He was given an unfair trial by the authorities. He was thrown in jail multiple times, which was not a comfortable jail like the ones we probably have today. That would be a bad comparison. He was beaten. At one time, he was led for dead. He was rejected by his own people. And then specifically, there was one time, which is the only time, that we see Paul in a prayer asking Jesus to heal him, physically heal him. Because he had a thorn in the flesh, we don't know what it is, but certainly Paul says he was very grieved by that physical illness. And he asked Jesus if he could heal him. What did Jesus tell him? 
blab it and grab it, claim it and have it? Jesus said no. Get that? Jesus told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. What does that mean? Grace, I think of it in two aspects. One is that God gives us what we don't deserve. We're blessed. And secondly, is that God's grace gives us the strength to deal with whatever it is that we're dealing. And because of that, then the peace that surpasses all understanding will come. We learned that, right, a couple weeks ago. And on that foundation, Paul is saying, I've learned to be content. It's all right. In whatever circumstance, I've learned to be content. The contentment that Paul had then, proven by trial and fire, we know that it's a contentment that cannot be taken away. Even if it's discouraged or feeling physical pain, as he probably was, discomfort, physical discomfort, the contentment that Paul had is something that cannot be taken away. Let us remember that, and that is an encouragement for us. That, that is a great consolation for us. That when we trust Christ truly, and we abide in Him, our joy, our contentment cannot be taken away. I'll close with this verse, a couple of verses, Romans 8, 38 and 39, which greatly emphasize and wrap that thought up. It says, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor heights nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May we have that type of assurance and joy by trusting in the perfect Savior, Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come to you asking us to please draw us to you today, to your kindness, to your love, to your forgiveness. That we may seek you, that you would grant us contentment in Christ, Lord. That your Holy Spirit would convict us and guide us in a life of repentance, for following over all kinds of worthless things. May we turn away from the things that we might chase after seeking for contentment or fulfillment. And may we focus on you, Lord, because your grace is sufficient for us. We cannot find the fulfillment our souls need, Lord, anywhere else other than in Christ. May we go away with joy knowing that precious and divine truth. Allow us that now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.